Very good. Okay, let's pray and we'll get into the the study here this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and for how you reveal yourself to us. And Lord, uh, the privilege of, of knowing you, of singing back your praises, Lord. We do praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we, we just ask that not only would this be a time of learning uh, some teaching, but also applying it to our life and understanding it better, who you are, Lord, the God of the Bible. And so I just pray that you would even in this reveal yourself to us in greater ways and manifest yourself. Holy Spirit, we pray through the acts that we do as well, uh, the gifts of the Spirit and so on. But just move, Lord, in our lives and in this time as we look at your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about the Trinity here. I did mention earlier that um, all the attributes of God, I think it was in one of the first studies of it back in, I don't remember when we started September or something like that. or But anyway, is that all the attributes of God are found in all three persons of the, of the Godhead. Uh, they're all them. I failed maybe to mention it more often, but it's, it's who God is and who he's eternally been. And again, I've, I've used this, this saying, I'm going to use it again today, just that God is not who you think he is. God is who he says he is, because that's important. And I hear people say that all the time. Well, my God, my God, and we kind of form a God or fashion a God in our own minds of what he, we'd like him to be. But does that change who he is? Uh, it doesn't at all. So it's important to see how, he, how God is revealed in the Bible, the God of the Bible, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's really important to see that anyway. So, but all the attributes are true. And in your notes at the beginning, I just wrote it's kind of so we can understand a little bit this term here, uh, the triune God. It says, God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person is fully God. And there's one God. What'd that do for you? <laughs> It's it's how he reveals himself in the word that we've been talking about this God and how do we know him and so on. But the Trinity means tri, three, uh, unity, in unity, three in oneness. Uh, the word Trinity, is it found in the Bible? Can anybody of the kids tell me? Is the word Trinity found in the Bible, you think? Seth says, yeah, anybody else want to help out? No? Okay. The, the, the no's have it right. Yeah, it's not, it's not in the Bible, but it's a her term that helps us. Actually, since I forgot and since we had a missionary last week, maybe you guys, especially the kids, the adults can answer after this, but uh, can you say out loud uh, what God is like? If I was to ask you, what is God like? What would you tell me? God is all powerful. Everywhere present. Everywhere present. Well, why not hear that? Unsearchable. I mean, I am. Wise. Good. Powerful. What else? Triune, hey. I I was surprised. Was that last or little Edward? Didn't Edward say that? Last week? I remember one time he mentioned triune. Where did that? Anyway, okay. Anyone else? Others that we may have forgotten? Wise, all wise. Anything else? Adults can come in too, anywhere. Jealous, holy, very good, gracious. Steadfast, good. Faithful, good. Any others we might have forgotten? Unchanging, amen. Righteous, hey, good. What else? Any any else? I mean, uh, I'm sure. Sovereign. 
sovereign, holy. Good. That's great. You guys are doing good. And so as we as we come to this last one, I'm trying to explain something that's kind of unfathomable, uh, something you can't really grasp and understand. This is how he reveals himself. And for me, that's good enough. <laughs> but I'm attempting to do something with the infinite God. And I'm being a finite person. I can know God. Did you? That's the interesting thing, isn't it? That you can know God, that you can have a relationship with him. But I can't really fully know God, can I? Uh, not fully. He's incomprehensible in the sense that he's so much vaster. And it's, it's amazing to me. I think in, in Sunday school today, Annie had said in the, that class that, you know, you can read the same verse over and over and over. And yet you read it one time and, and you get something new out of it. And that's the way it is with God and our relationship with him. We grow in this day by day. And it's, uh, so we do, we, we're approaching a subject that's very, <laughs> though the word is not in here, the principles are, are taught in it. And some people reject everything they can't explain. So they deny that God is, is, is Trinity. But um, just like a lot of things I don't understand, I know a little bit about electricity, but I don't have to know everything about it to enjoy it, do I? I get to enjoy electricity even without understanding a lot and the benefits of that. And I think that's the way it is with God, too. We don't have to. There's mystery in God. There, I, I really believe there's mystery in God far beyond what we can comprehend. I mean, it blows my mind when I read certain verses. And one of them was today. And man, that's a sermon in Daniel we were doing today where it says that of, of King Belshazzar that God holds his very breath in his hands. He holds their very breath. Every breath you take is due to God. It just blows my mind. Um, and, and try to comprehend deeper things. And even Jesus said, you know, if I, you don't understand these earth, how can I talk to you about heavenly things? <laughs> my goodness. And so we're limited in this. And so I realize the task, but I'm going to do my best here to explain uh, how God reveals himself this way. Um, all right, in creation, on some of your notes there, I'll just start it off with that. The Father's notice in Genesis 1-1, where he says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's God the Father. You go down to verse 2 in Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God. There you have the Holy Spirit. And you get to the New Testament in James, or no, not, Colossians 1, 16. For by him, and it's speaking of Christ, if you look at the context, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And in John uh, 1, it says, nothing that was made was made without him. Nothing that was made... But, it can be that was made was made without Christ. Isn't that interesting? So there at the beginning, even in creation, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, I wrote number one on your thing, God is three persons, okay? God is three persons. And uh, for each, each person of the Trinity is distinct. And I just left you a bunch of verses there to keep for your own study and and time we're not going to go through them now time will permit holy spirit as well is a distinct person i think the best drawing i've saw i wish i had put a copy of it up there but it had like god here the son here and the holy spirit down here and just for the sake of the example it said the father pointing an arrow to jesus it said and below it it said the father is not the son the son and an arrow point is not the Spirit. In other words, they're distinct persons. The Spirit is not the Father. But then inside, it had God at the center of this triangle, and arrows pointing to from the Father. The Father's God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And I thought that really, I wish I'd have put it up so you could kind of see it. So that's what we're trying to explain here, that God is three persons, distinct, just three distinct persons. Um, now, there are teachings out there that that don't agree with that, that's 
that basically say, no, there's not three persons. Uh, there is modalism, or it, it means that he changes modes. He's the same person, but he changes modes. In other words, maybe in the Old Testament, he was God the Father. In the New Testament, he changes his mode and comes as Jesus. And then now today, he changes mode when he went back into heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. Now he's the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's one person, but wears three masks. Okay? That's what some people teach. And, and today, there is a, a group, and we met him with Matt, uh, the Oneness Pentecostal group, that believes in, G in basically the same thing. Jesus only, they say. And uh, so when they baptize people, they baptize them only in the name of Jesus. And by the way, they think baptism is required for salvation as well. But you find these things out, that there are groups around that still believe that. And this was settled. This, this question was settled in Nicaea, uh, the Nicaean Creed, which is still used today. It's the only one creed that agreed by Roman Catholics, the Anglican Church, the most Protestants. And it's kind of held through the history of time. It's kind of like in the book of Acts where they had that meeting to talk about does salvation include circumcision and so on like that. And they said, well, let's get everybody together and talk and discuss this. And then the, they send out letters that, no, it doesn't, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. But the church was wondering because there were people teaching that in order to be saved, you had to be. And so it's kind of this happened when a, a heresy began to grow and say, well, Jesus is not God. And so the people came to, in the modern day Turkey, it would have been then, and they got together to discuss this issue. And they've written out a creed that has stood the ages of time. And read it if you want sometime uh, and meditate over it. But it's quite the, quite the creed that holds, you know, kind of the teachings that we believe here today and continue to believe. Um, all right. Uh, so, number one, there is three persons. Number two, each person is fully God. You have, this is the teaching of the Bible. The Father is clearly God. The Son is fully God, and you can look up those passages, and the Holy Spirit is fully God. And, of course, what they faced in that day in 325 to settle that issue was Arianism. It started by the guy by a name of Arius uh, from Alexandria, an elder there, a bishop, and he, he really kind of pushed this that, no, Jesus is not fully God. The Holy Spirit is not fully God. And so they got together to discuss this and set up this creed because of that. But he is. And uh, there are groups today that don't believe that Jesus is God. Uh, the Jehovah Witnesses is one. They don't believe that Jesus is God. Uh, Michelle's shaking her head back there because the first time she walked into this church, she was a Jehovah Witness. So <laughs> she grew up in that. can tell you more about that than I can. But so you, it's, it's important to see this. Number one, God is three persons. Each person is fully God. And you can look up the scriptures. And number three, there is one God. There is one God. Um, and I wrote some of these out just so we see in the Shema, how the Jews will say, this hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God, what Matt was talking about this morning. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. But the Lord your God is one. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. James 2, 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. <laughs> so God is one. In other, in other passages here, I hope you take the time to look them up, some of them. Because in Isaiah, some really good ones, he, he just talks about, there is no other God besides me. And he keeps referring to that. You see the singularity of it there. That there's only one God, um, not not three gods. That's what in the Muslims when you start to talk with them too. Oh, so you have three gods? No, <laughs> we have one God in three persons. And again, tried to explain it, but um, uh, the Westminster Westminster Shorter Catechism, uh, which is kind of set up the same way with cre uh, just questions for kids and, and adults too. But just to help the people learn answers to the Bible. And so ask questions. Question number five is this. Are there more gods than one? The answer is there is but one only, the living and true God. And it gives scripture references for all of these points. Number six, the question is how many persons are there in the Godhead? 
And the answer is, there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. Equal in power in, and glory. All right, that's kind of, I want to, those three have to line up. You have to use those three as kind of guidelines. If you can stay in, some people in trying to simplify it have got to reject one or the one or the other of it. And I think that's happened. And there's really no explanation that you can give to really try to explain that real well. I tried with a little bit of figure there. That fails at uh, even symbols. I remember I was, when we were in Germany, a missionary too was driving his Mercedes there and he says, you know, I got a good explanation of the Trinity because you could see it right on the dash there on the, the hood of the car. And he said, look at that, it didn't remind you of the Trinity. There's one God and three persons, you know, three. I thought, well, that's as good as I've heard of any others as well, you know, like water and three different forms, you know. But they all fall short, don't they, of really explaining who he is. But um, Genesis 1, 26, at the uh, when God said that he would make us in his image, look at that, Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, okay, God is speaking. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice that? God speaking, and he said, let us. Who is he to, who's the us? The Godhead, the Trinity. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. How did he create him? Male and female. It's the only genders I see. And he, saw, he created them. And so there you have, let us make man in our image. And I, I think it's just important to see these things as you read the Bible, how God reveals himself like this. At the incarnation, or anyway, when Jesus was about to be born, remember the angel comes and speaks to Mary, right? And she says, well, how can I, how can I have a child? I, I don't even know a man yet. I'm not really married as in the sense. We're not together yet. And the angel has to explain to her, and you know in Luke 135, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. There's the one. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High. There you have the Father, will overshadow you, and there will be a child, and therefore the child uh, to be born in, uh, will be called Holy, the Son of God. And even there, when the angel comes to you, he mentions all three persons of the Holy Trinity. And so I think it's, it's eye-opening to see these things, to see this God, how he reveals himself, even without using the word Trinity. You just It's kind of a word we use to help us grasp this concept. Um, again, going to Jesus's baptism, where John the Baptist is in the water, and Jesus comes down into the water to be baptized in Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from there, from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him, so resting on Jesus. And behold, the voice from heaven, there you have the Father, that said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see it again? You see how it's everywhere in the Bible? At the beginning, let us make man in our image. What do you think it's talking about when he says he accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his own will? Counsel, why does he have to use the word counsel if he's, there's three persons can counsel in perfect unity. And uh, so uh, they're here. There's a voice from heaven, the Father. There's a Spirit of God descending on Jesus, which is the third. You have all three here represented in his baptized. And it's the unchanging God, right? We talked about that one time. God says, I change not. So this has been this way from all eternity, that they've eternal. That's why they sometimes were ad eternally existed as Father. Son, because other groups teach that Jesus was created by God. And yet Jesus, even the passage we read in Colossians says, nothing was made, nothing, nothing was made without him. So he couldn't include himself if he was nothing. Anyway, there are people that teach that. So anyway, just so you know, um, then we have here 
Uh, well, let me just explain. There's love in the Trinity. There existed before we were created. There was already pleasure. There was love in, in, in community, should I say, because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they loved each other. And I love this way. The voice from heaven says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What he's saying is, he's always pleased me. <laughs> he's always been a pleasure to me. From eternity past, he was a pleasure. And he's just letting us know down here, hey, I'm pleased with this one. This is my beloved son and him. I listen to him, listen to him. And so I think this is well worth knowing that there was love in the Godhead before. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, but let me go to the great commission where Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven. And he gives this, let me just ask the question, was the great commission for our day or is that something that just for the apostles to do, go into all the world? Is that for them? Is that for us today? You bet, it's for us today. And that's why in Sunday school, Bruce is doing this class on, if you ever wondered, you know, how I want to be more effective in sharing my faith. I want to understand what to tell people. Because that's a struggle I had early on in my Christian life is, well, I want to talk about Jesus, but where do I start? What do I, what do I tell people? I'm, I'm you know, uh, I don't know where to start. Well, this, this class that we're doing in Sunday school, I encourage you, to, if you've never attended Sunday school, at least for the next, I don't know how many weeks, we'll be doing on this, how to share your faith with people. And so I encourage you to come to that and, and, and take part and learn. And you can always, Jesus said to the disciples, didn't he? I'm, I know I'm going off track here, but didn't he tell the disciples, hey, you know, follow me and I'll teach you to become, he said, fishers of men. It's something they were not but they had to be taught to become. And so he says, follow me and I will uh, make you become fishers of men. And so they were fishers of fish at this point. They knew how to catch fish, but they didn't know how to catch men. And Jesus said, I'm going to train you in that. And well, you can see it in the Bible. Maybe these next few weeks, I'll have something along those lines as well on Sunday morning. But anyway, so here the Great Commission comes, and that's for us. And Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There again, you have the Godhead represented there, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The three persons are listed together in parallel structure and give equal honor to each. Each is given the equal honor. And so... We're baptizing people, and that's if you're being baptized, often I'll say that too, you know, baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But notice it says name here. It doesn't say baptize them in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Notice it's singular again. Why? Because God is one. I can't explain, but that's just what it is. <laughs> names, but name. Baptizing them in the name. One God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and the triune God lives in the believer. John 14, 23, that actually, if you read from 15 to 23, you'd find all the Godhead in this passage. I didn't write it down, but you can read it another time. But I just put out 23. Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we, we will come to him and make our home with him. Isn't that, isn't that special? That Jesus is telling the disciples, man, if you believe, we will come. We will come and actually inhabit you, live in you. Paul, Christ in me, the hope of glory that the living God actually wants to take residence in this temple called my body. This is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a temple of God. It's where God lives and moves in my life and in your life. And I remember when my grandpa, he was the first one to come to Christ in all of our relationship. He was a bartender before that and knew nothing really of God much. But when he came to Christ and, and he became a preacher of the gospel, he would tell people, he would, as he would stand and preach, he says, you know, these are not my hands. These are the hands of the Holy Spirit. 
These are not my feet. He'd stand out there and show people his feet and say, these are the feet of the Holy Spirit. What he was saying in that, this is God lives in me. And what a privilege to hear that from Jesus himself saying, we're going to take, we, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, take residence in us sinful human beings. Amazing thing. But that's what the redemption is all about, isn't it? That he would be our God and we would be his people. Awesome thing that we get to experience even this morning. And so here we have the Trinity in that. And you can read all of John chapter 14, actually 14 through 16. The chapters are great for this. But we will come to him and make our home, our home, our dwelling. Home is a sweet place, isn't it? There's no place like home, you say. And you get home after a rough day, it's nice to be home. Isn't it? But for God, the, the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit, to claim our hearts as his home, a place where he can feel at home, is an awesome thing. We ought to treat that right, too. A.W. Tozer, here's what he said on, on the Trinity. I like this section. He says, the person of the Godhead being one, have one will have one will. And I say that because it's not like the Father up in heaven, uh, Jesus decided, well, I'm just going to go down and redeem mankind, and God the Father say, no, don't go, don't do that. <laughs> you know? There's never discrepancy there. They have one will. They have one will. So the persons of the Godhead being of one will, they work together, and never one smallest act is done by one without instant acquiescence of the other two. Every act of God is accomplished by the Trinity in unity. In unity. They may, we try to say they have different functions, and they, in the sense they, they do in our salvation and so on. You can look at those verses. I put them in your notes for some other time, and they do, but they work in unison. Uh, it's in unity. And so the Trinity of God really demonstrates to us, too, that God is eternally loving, and I said community, a relationship. Uh, before humankind was created, God lived eternally and loved in community with himself. I, I, I explained that. Now, that's why I brought up these verses here on love. Uh, there's love and relationship in the Godhead. God is love. That comes from 1 John 4, 8, and 16. And Jesus, remember when he said uh, to the, I think it was the Pharisees, but he said, I know the Father. In fact, if I told you that I don't know him, I'd be a liar. <laughs> he says, I know the Father. So there's relationship. But uh, listen to this, John 14, 3. But I do as the Father commands me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Jesus said, I want the world. I want you disciples. I want you to, to know that I love the Father. John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, oh, so the Father loves Jesus. Even or as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Is that a thought? That'd take a week to meditate on that, huh? As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You mean God loves me? God the Father loves me. Jesus loves me like he lo they love one another. Abide in my love. Well, who, who doesn't want to now after you hear that? John 17, 23. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. There's love of the Father again to us. There's love. That's why I can say, John can make statements like that. God is love. That's who he is. Even before we came around, some people think that God was lonely, and so he created man just to, because he needed something. Does God need anything? He could be fully satisfied in himself without us. And yet, uh, tell me, have we been in a little bit of a trouble, a thorn in his flesh? <laughs> uh, being sinful and fallen? And yet he's still willing to, that love that's in the Godhead still, he wants to express that. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he loved us. And so I, I put 1 John 1, 3 at the end of that section. 
that which we have seen and heard and proclaimed to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, there's fellowship, there's communion in the Godhead, and now with us included in that, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Communion. And I left the last one that we'll look at really today. Um, for 2 Corinthians 13, 4, it's kind of, uh, you could use that as today's benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Hmm. There you have three, don't you? The, love of, uh, the, the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. John 3, 16, for God so loved. What did he do? By grace sent a Savior. Jesus brings the grace of God down to man and then creates a fellowship through the Holy Spirit. We have fellowship with him. Do you know the Holy Spirit? I mean, a lot of people refer to the Holy Spirit as a force, as a power. He's not that. He's a person. Because in the Bible, even in, in the book of Acts, remember when Ananias and Sapphira lied about giving? And the, 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 the desire, the, they came up and they said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You can't lie to a force, but you can lie to a person. What does the Bible tell us in another place? Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You can only grieve a person. And so, you know what? When I've grieved the Holy Spirit, I say, Holy Spirit, forgive me. I've grieved you. I've grieved your heart. He's a person. I remember, I'll never forget this, Bob, not too long ago. I Forgive me if I say it wrong. But he says, today, let's talk about the Trinity. I believe in the Trinity, God the Father and God the Son. Then he sat there silent. I was waiting for it. Then I said, oh, I get it. He's one we don't talk about very much. The Holy Spirit. He's God, eternal God, equal to the Father and the Son. He's the one. Who's, we've been singing the song and leaving your spirit until your work on earth is done. He's here now. He's ministering to us even now in our own hearts and lives at this very moment. And so he's, he consists of all three. So again, this is, this is the God we worship. Is it not? This God is, this is how he reveals himself in the Bible. And this is the one then we ought to worship. And so I think that's why we come to the end of uh, this topic again. And I, I just said at the beginning, I just wanted this as I go through this, uh, through the attributes and understanding what God is like. I want to know him better. I want to know what he's like more, more intimate. I want a deeper relationship. Just like over time, I get to know Shelly better than I've ever known her. I knew her certainly a lot better than when we were engaged. I know her a lot more now. And so it's just, but what with God? So I hope that, that this study has been somewhat of a help in your notes. You can always add to them. It's not exhaustive at all. Just add to them as you discover new things about God that are true, that are in his word, not, not just through maybe a dream you had or something that doesn't have anything to do with the word. Make sure everything, you back it up with the word of God. And that you're able to worship him better. I want to worship him more. I mean, good night if those uh, wise men from the East, could, the Magi, come from hundreds of miles away to spend just a moment's time with this little baby and it says they fell down and they worshiped him. I want better worship of this true and living God. He deserves it. And you see it in the Bible, you just get to the book of Revelation, you see how he is worshiped in heaven. There stood a lamb. And the cries that go out from there is worthy is the Lamb to receive glory and honor and praise. You think you're going to start that in heaven or can you start that now? I mean, don't you think our, our worship of him should be what we see it done in heaven? Isn't that the worship he deserves? And shouldn't he get that in our gatherings here? Like that when we sing or in our prayers to God? Worthy. See that Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world and just... Tell him, tell him, Lord, you're worthy of all honor, 
glory, praise. You could say that. Each person of the Trinity, God's not offended. <laughs> he is the triune God. And so the importance of this teaching, too, is this, uh, this is how God reveals himself in the Bible. Many, and you'll hear this people say the Muslims and Jews and Christians all worship the same God. No, they don't. You begin to talk to them about it, and you talk to Trinity, they're not going to agree with you. And so to say that, and I hear that all the time, oh, we worship the same God. Allah is the same God. No, he's mono. He's only one person, and he's kind of aloof from everybody. You don't really get to have a relationship with him. Why? Because he's, he's one. He doesn't know. He can, all they can hope for and ask for, Allah, is mercy. But I don't hear or ever heard, and I worked with Muslims in Macedonia, that ever talked about love, God loving them. That is a concept that's kind of foreign. But aren't you glad the God of the Bible loves what he created? and wants to have a relationship and interaction with. He wants to be with you tomorrow morning when you go to work. He wants to be, as Matt talked about, the center of our attention all the time. Yes, we're busy doing other things, but keeping him first in it, seeing him, asking him to reveal himself as we go through life. And if Jesus wasn't God, then we would be, if we worshiped him, we would be idolaters, wouldn't we? <laughs> And yet the Bible commands us to worship him, as a wise man did. So keep those things before you. Again, point number one, God is three persons. Number two, each person is fully God. And number three, there is one God, one God. And so I hope this, this helps you a little bit and maybe clear up some uh, maybe it's muddied the waters and you have to do a little more study, but you got plenty of scripture to work with here in the notes that I gave you. And uh, be happy to talk to you if, uh, about anything else. Or if you have questions, what about uh, the Jehovah Witnesses? And Michelle can help you with those kind of things and what they teach. But uh, isn't it good that we get to know this God? I I'll never know him fully, but I want to know him better than I do now. And he wants to know you. Did you know that's in his heart, the heart, of, heart of hearts that he really wants to know us and have that relationship? With you? So let's pray and then we'll close. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Son. We thank you for the Father. We thank you, Holy Trinity, that we can talk to you, that there is love and relationship in community with you yourself and we get to enter into this communion and fellowship sinful as we are we thank you for the cleansing of our sins that you offered through the blood of the cross of your son we praise you lord and i pray this study that we've done would just help us to love you more to worship you better uh, to serve you better than we do now we thank you again today lord for the privilege of of being just able to open up your word. And I pray as we go through this word, Lord, we can, as we open up your word, Lord, would you reveal yourself to us in greater ways? Give us greater understanding of it as we go and what you want of us. And thank you, Lord, that we get to do this in community of the church, that you love the church and you gave her, yourself for her. Thank you for calling us out of this world into this church and into a relationship with you. And keep us, Lord, from just being religious and wanting to walk after some kind of form, but deny the power of it. O oh, power of God, be at work in our life, transforming us, as Matt said, more and more into your image, that image of your likeness, God, that we be more and more like Christ every day. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, for the reality of that we can live in this in Jesus' name. Amen. Could we sing Praise You, Father, Praise You, the last song? I think it was the last thing. And we'll just close after this song. So.